Hey, if you've struggled to build chemistry with someone that you've never played tennis with, you are going to love this video today on doubles instruction because that's exactly what we're going to do today. We're going to teach you, in fact, 10 ways to build a connection with somebody that you've never even met. We're going to teach you the number one way to get the absolute best out of your doubles partner. And we're going to show you five questions that you need to ask your partner before you even play. And we've got even some bonus trains and bonus gifts. So if this sounds good to you, let's get started. Okay, very cool. So here we go. Your number one goal, first of all, you've never played with somebody. It's not to be better than your partner. It's not to play better tennis than your partner. It's not to be their boss. Okay. I think these are two things that people, especially if they're better, get really, really wrong if they want to get the absolute best out of their partner. In fact, what you want to do is you want to be a leader by following, okay? And so we're gonna get into this. What we wanna do is there's a big myth out there. There's a chemistry myth. The myth is that you need to be in the lead if you're gonna have any kind of chemistry, that if you're the better player, you gotta completely take charge. And there's also a myth that, you know, you can't really play great doubles with somebody that you never met before, that you need to be playing with them for a long time. Now, certainly that helps, but if you have, really, really good traits of a doubles partner, and you can build instant chemistry. So here we go. Let's get into these 10 ways that you can do this. Now, the number one thing, if it's possible, I know sometimes it's not possible, but if you've never met this person, just have a talk before you go on the court. Just have a chat. Get to know them. Build rapport. Doesn't even have to be talking about tennis. This kind of trying to build a connection, showing that you're a nice person and that they don't have to be intimidated by playing with you. Lots of times people are very, very nervous when they're going to be playing with you, especially if they feel that they may be the weaker link, okay? So uh, it's a good thing and you just go, and even if you are the weaker link, don't be afraid, go up and start a conversation. It, it, it could be uh, a big difference when you guys finally go out there and start playing a match. The next thing I want you to do is in your conversation, is I want you to be vulnerable. I want you to share your weaknesses first. This is gonna open up the conversation to where you are going to then learn more about their game. So if you're like, yeah, um, you know, I get, I have a weak backhand or I'm not comfortable serving volume or whatever it is about your game, letting them know that, hey, if you could give me a little bit of extra help with this or these are shots I don't like and these are shots I do like, then that's going to help build that connection and they're going to get to learn some really good intel about their game and then they're in turn going to want to share more about their game, right? It's like, if you tell me your secret first, I'll tell you mine, all right? And that's good. That's good information that you guys are going to need when you go out into the court. The next thing, and this is probably the biggest thing, one of the biggest lessons I've ever learned is lead by following. I was lucky enough one time to go to this tennis fantasy camp where I got to play with Mark Woodford. You might have heard this story before you followed me for a little while, but I think it's worth repeating. I was extremely nervous. Clearly the weakest link going to be out there if I'm playing with a legend like Mark Woodford. The Woodies won so many Grand Slam titles as a doubles team. And one of the coolest things was Right away, he had a smile on his face, and he was always asking me what I wanted to do. He would say, hey, where are you feeling the serve? You know, where, where do you want to serve on this point? And I would say, oh, I want to serve down the middle. I want to serve out wide. He'd say, all right, mate, you know, go for that. He would ask me what kind of returns I'm feeling. And then every once in a while, he would steer me by saying, hey, why don't you take a good crack at this down the line? You see what he's doing there? He's leading by following. He's deferring to me, but then every once in a while, since he's given so much leeway, every now and then he makes a suggestion on the shot he wants me to play. And of course, I'm more than happy to do that. And it gave me confidence to go for the shot. And that's what I really loved about playing with him. And I will never forget that experience. So thank you, Mark Woodford. All right. Number four is be excited. Be excited to meet your new partner. Okay. Okay. Your attitude means so much. 
So that's number four, is you be excited. Don't, don't, don't be in a bad mood. Don't be grumpy. If you're, if you're used to, if you're someone who's a shy person, you got to break out of your shell. All right. Um, number five is I want you to be ready for a team performance. This is a big, big deal. You want to be ready for a team performance and not an individual performance. I want to come back and talk to you about this because this is huge. So many people when they're playing doubles are concerned about how they're going to play. They're, they're thinking, well, if I play good doubles and we lose, you know, it's not my fault. You know, how many times have you gotten off the court and you've said or you've heard somebody say, well, yeah, you know, I actually played pretty good today, but my partner didn't. So, you know, therefore it was my partner's fault. We lost. And so you can feel good about that. That's not what it's about. Even if it's true, that's not what it is about. Um, you want to get ready for a team sport. You are now a team. And I think for tennis players, since you're always working on your strokes and your game, and most people start out with singles, it's hard to get into the concept that it is a team game. It's a team sport and that you win together, you lose together, and you need to be making decisions together. You need to be flowing as a team together. So that's huge. Uh Here's one thing you can do to make that habit work is you can come together in between every point and you want to think of yourself as the catcher. OK, if you if you watch a baseball game, the pitcher is pitching, the catch, the catcher is catching the ball. And then when it's time to have a consultation, that catcher is going to always be thinking about taking care of the pitcher. They're going to run out to the pitcher. The pitcher's not going to walk to, to home plate to have a conversation. And so especially, and you'll see Roger Federer do this, you'll see lots of people who have been trained on how to play doubles, even if they're mostly singles players. Anybody on the pro tour, they know these little tricks and tips, is you will notice that the person who's the net player is always going to the server because they are then the pitcher. They're the ones that need to be taken care of. They're the ones that have the, all the pressure. Also, if your partner's getting ready to return, it's good for you to go over to them, give them a little fist bump, give them a little high five, a word of encouragement, or a little bit of a strategy talk and get to know, you know, okay, are we going to lob this return? Are we going to try and cross court? Are we chipping and charging and coming in? These are all really, really important pieces of information that you need to know because if you don't know what your partner's going to even thinking about hitting and if you're not sharing that information, then you guys are just playing by the seat of your pants. You, you don't, you're not taking advantage a big, big thing to be able to play better doubles together. Number seven, again, if you're used to playing singles, this is not easy for people to do, is to talk on changeovers. And it doesn't always have to be about strategy. Sometimes I think that's important to talk a little strategy, but you can see here Roger and Stan, they're just kind of smiling. They have that connection. They have that rapport. You know, why are the Bryan brothers so good? They know each other. The Williams sisters. I mean, there's been so many great family members who have been awesome doubles players because they have that connection. So, you know, again, don't think like a singles player there on the changeover where you just focus on you and your thoughts. Share your thoughts. It's important to smile and laugh, okay? And especially because none of us here watching this video, I don't think, and if you are, congratulations, I don't think any of us are going to Wimbledon. We should be playing this sport for fun. And one of the most rewarding experiences besides winning the match is you, if you've never met this person, you may make a friend for life. And I think lots of times people lose sight of why they get into tennis. You know, I think most people get into tennis, especially if they get into it as an adult and not as a junior trying to become a professional. But most people get into tennis because A, it's healthy. It's something healthy and positive to do. And maybe they're looking for some new friends, a new social outlet. And if you're just out there thinking about winning the match and that your partner is just uh, you know, a pawn out there for you, then you're missing a big opportunity. Smile, laugh, build a connection. And whether you win or lose, you might ultimately win because you might pick up a really cool friend and doubles partner for life. Okay. I already got to that one. Let's go to the next slide is be very physical. And I don't mean here this picture. This is just a great picture because, hey, it's Roger and Rop on the court. But uh, they got very physical, actually, where they, um, you know, I, I think uh, Roger picked up Rafa. Isn't that right? Or did Rafa pick up Roger? One of them picked up the other one. But anyway, the Bryan brothers, they always do guest bumps 
high fives. You know, you obviously don't need to be that dramatic about it. You don't have to be so dramatic to where you're doing a chest bump or you're lifting each other up. I understand that's maybe it's maybe for the first meeting a little too much. Let's face it. But the idea of fist bumps, if you like fist bumps, high fives, you know, things like that. That's very, very important. And people at the recreational level over, overlook that. I just see people you know, when they play doubles, they just kind of swip, swap back and forth and they're kind of moving like this. They're not they're not coming together. And and so that's what I mean by being physical with each other is is it does make a connection, especially if you've never had something with this partner before. You've never played with them. That's a big deal. OK. And number 10. And this is is this is the most important is don't freak out. Don't freak out and be negative with your emotions because five terrible things are going to happen. If you go out now, tennis, of course, and. I've thrown my racket. I've been a complete jerk on the court, okay? I have done everything, so don't think I'm sitting here being Mr. Perfect. But if you're playing doubles and you let your attitude, you know, get the best of you, then all of a sudden it's going to be really bad because, you know, first of all, it's been shown so many times, it's just going to make you play bad. So you start to play worse. That's... That's number one is you start getting negative. Very few people start playing better. So you're just going to you're not helping your team because you're now you're acting like a jerk and you're playing worse. Number two is you're going to make your partner start to play bad. Why might your partner start to play bad? Because you're acting like a jerk. Well, now all of a sudden they're going to start, you know, have you, have you ever heard the concept of mirroring, mirroring where people kind of mimic and copy each other's uh, behaviors without even realizing it, your partner may start to go really, really negative. And so now all of a sudden they're cursing up a storm and they might outdo you. You might you might start freaking out and being negative and then you're like, holy cow, who's this guy? He's crazy. Well, you kind of started the whole snowball effect there. The next thing is your partner might start playing really bad because they're nervous. They see you freaking out and they don't know how to handle that. OK, they don't know how to handle it, that you are acting like a complete jerk on the court. So that's very, very important to have uh, your composure and be positive out there. OK, so the, the next thing I want to talk about is I want to talk about five questions that you should be asking your partner. These are very, very important questions, and I'm just going to read through them here. So the first question that you want to ask if you've never played with your partner is, what side do you prefer to play on? This is a very big deal, and most of us have very, very strong opinions on it. And lots of times, here's a little, here's a little trick. You know, when people first start, um, when they first meet each other, they usually want to be very accommodating. They want to be very accommodating. They want to defer. So you might think, well, I don't want to ask what side they want because I want the do side. I play way better than the do side. Well, lots of times you'll still get your way. Rather than saying, I want to play the do side today, you might say, hey, what side do you prefer? And then for the first meeting, usually people go, well, um, what side do you like? And then you might go, well, I, I like the do side. You know, what do you think about that idea? They might go, oh, that's okay. That's cool. I, I'm pretty good on the ad side. Or they might say, well, I can't make a return on the ad side. Well, then there you go. If you can make if you can make some shots on the ad side, you might say, all right, well, today I'm not going to play the do side. I'll play the ad side. They already said they can't make a return on that side. I'm not so bad. So we'll do that. Number two is you ask them, do you prefer to serve first or second? This is going to tell you a lot about your partner's confidence. On, on their, their strength of serve, on their strength of their second serve, how they back up their game, you know. Uh, that's a very, very important question to ask. Where do they feel comfortable serving the rotation first or second? The next question to ask is, do you like to serve in volley or do you like to stay back? And this can also, again, help you with your strategy. So let's say you like to serve in volley and they say they like to stay back. Well, then you're knowing, okay, this is might be putting a little bit of pressure on me, which is okay. I'm not going to tell them this, but you're thinking, okay, just by that answer alone, I might have to poach a little more. I might have to be a little more aggressive because if my partner does get pinned back there, uh, we could be in trouble. 
uh, so I might have to move a little more. Let's say you don't like to serve in value, and then they said they don't like to serve in value. Well, what does this mean? There's nothing wrong, guys, and you guys could be an, an amazingly tough team to beat, especially if you're good on, on the, um, the baseline. There's nothing wrong with playing two back. So if you're not good at the net and your partner's not good at the net, but you guys are awesome at the baseline, don't think you have to play that traditional um, staggered position to where you're at the net, one at the net, one at the baseline. If you guys are both awesome at the baseline and really good defenders, well, you might want to try playing two back. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Uh, the next question, I think this is a question number four, a uh, very good question to ask is what's your favorite shot? What's your favorite shot? Is it your serve? Is it your volley? Is it your backhand, your forehand? Again, this will help you guys set each other up for the opportunities you want. Knowing that if a ball is crossed in the middle and you're not so confident going for it, but you think you should because you've been told by your coach that, hey, you should take that middle ball, but then knowing that it's going to go right to your partner's forehand and you they said they have an awesome forehand, and then you're seeing them in the warm-up and they really do have an awesome forehand, well, you might want to let that go so that they can crack it, okay? Especially if you're not particularly comfortable crossing that. These are all the, the little nuances you're getting and, and information you're picking up and strategies you can implement by just talking. You see how powerful this is? All right, the next thing you want to ask is what's your least favorite shot? What's your least favorite shot? That's question number five. And so you see, just having this little bit of conversation, you see how much intel we picked up. You see, you see how much we're learning about each other. This is this is awesome stuff. Okay. And then I did just want to go through some just some bonus training for you guys. Hopefully you've gotten a lot out of this, but I just want to talk about the flow of the match and what you guys can do. First of all, in the warm-up. Start picking up some intel. Start noticing how your part, how your uh, opponent that you're warming up with, how they hit, what they're good at, what they're not so good at. So you can tell your partner. Then you can ask them as well. Um, the first couple of games that you play, I want you to keep things simple. I want you to keep your game plan simple. Uh, the simple thing is sim simple little rules for tennis. Think about getting your first serve and making your first volley and going cross court. Okay, if you don't like to serve and volley, go cross, hit cross, three balls cross court. Say to your say to your teammate, and then maybe they'll follow suit. Say, hey, you know, I'm not a serve and volleyer, um, but you know what I, my goal is every point for the first couple of games before I open up my game, I'm going to hit three balls in a row cross court every time. And and just by doing that, people are nervous. They that's when you're going to see a flutter of unforced errors. This is the way a match usually goes. In the beginning of the match, you can see your opponents make a lot of unforced errors. First of all, they are nervous. They're not warmed up. Their feet aren't moving great. So if you can make three shots in a row cross court, that's going to be good. The other thing is when it gets tighter in a match, right? When you get to that five all, six all game, that's when unforced errors might start creeping in again because then the nerves return, the feet stop moving, so very, very important. Uh, in game two or three, you might want to do something I call the no-risk poach. What is what is the no-risk poach? Now, the no-risk poach is when you're on the returning side. Let me get the – so you're on the returning side. Let's say your partner's returning there. You're up here. Your partner hits the ball cross court, and you're going to cross over here and try and steal. And if it doesn't work, your partner is going to back you up. So you might want to – you might want to look that up on YouTube, one of my videos, and look up the no risk poach, and you can see exactly what it is. And you might want to talk to your partner about it, maybe for the second time you play, maybe the second time you play, you do that. Um, and then here's here's one thing that's very very important: as the match develops late in the set, let's say it's it's gone to five all or six all or six five. Okay, it's a changeover. Now you guys want to get together. This is where you can have a huge advantage over your competition. You guys get together and you talk about what's working and what's not working. You just kind of remind each other, like, hey, your, your forehand uh, cross court or, or occasionally when you hit that return down the line, that's working. And, and that person at the net, they're not really good at the net, so they're actually missing that shot at the net. You know, just, you know, just remind each other who's the stronger player on the court on the other side, who's the weaker player, what they're making, what they're missing, what's working for your 
partner. Uh, you can ask them, do you notice anything that I'm doing well that 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 isn't working that I'm doing? You know, be very open, okay? Be open and vulnerable. That's how you're going to be the best team and defer. And, and the other thing I love in tight situations in a match, here's, here's some shots I love. I love lobs on returns. I love lobs on returns in pressure situations because now the opponents, they have to communicate. They have to talk and they have to move their feet. These are things that break down in pressure situations, especially if they're not doing it well to begin with. And you'll see a good team and a bad team when you play. All, you'll, they'll, they're not going to be doing all the things I'm telling you. They're not going to be talking. They're not going to be communicating. They're going to be two singles players out there. So if you see that, it's a good sign to throw up a lob on a big point because that's a, you know a very good chance that they will miss it. Okay, the other thing is cross-court balls. Stay cross-court, play high percentage, don't be hitting the shot early in a point down the line unless the other team is just not very good at the net. And then I love strategic poaches. You know, poaches on big points, if, you, if it is working, if the poach is working, if you feel comfortable poaching and you can do it on a big point, that can really, really throw some nerves into the competition, especially if they know that you're not afraid to move. Even if you lose that point, you might still win that set because uh, of, of just other unforced errors you're creating by being active up there. Okay, so that is it. I hope you really enjoyed this video. Now, I know I went through a lot. I'm actually going to give you those 10 slides if you want. If you want to you click up here, I will um, send those 10 slides to you so you can, you can know exactly. You can share it with your new partner. You can share it with your new partner. So now the pressure's off you. You can just say, hey, look, I, I found this for when you, know, you first play with somebody. We might want to look at this and, and see. You know, it's nice to meet you. What do you think about that? Is that worth, is this video worth you clicking on that subscribe down there, right there? Where, how, there it is. Oh, there, now I'm right over it. I'm right over that subscribe button. And every time you subscribe, the Bryan brothers adopt a starving puppy. Did you know that? They, they adopt and they give a starving puppy to a brand new family. Every, every time that you subscribe to our channel, that's what happens. The, the Brian brothers reach deep in their heart and they get a puppy and they give it to a family and it makes everything great. So if you could just subscribe, that'd be awesome. I hope you like this video. And if you like this video, guess what? There's more videos coming right up after this video that you should watch. This is Pete from Crunch Time Coaching signing off. That's teaching you how to play better doubles with somebody you never even met. My gosh, that was awesome. We'll be back with more videos.